Hello everyone, Brad Johnson here, and in this video I'm going to be bringing in Adronis so he can discuss what is in the background, Oumuamua. So I will go ahead and bring Adronis in, and he'll give us some insight relating to this extraordinary celestial object, uh, about its function, about where it's from, who inhabits it, uh, and so forth. And this information uh, was uh, captured through uh, the book that is going to be available in Japan called The Sixth Density Messenger. It is the Adronis book that is going to be available in August in Japan. And so, as it is only translated in Japanese, I wanted to do this video uh, for Adronis to share a lot uh, based on what he was talking about for that book, the Adronis book in Japan, The Sixth Density Messenger, and share it for the English audience. And he may even elaborate on a little bit more details as well, too. So I'll leave it to Adronis, and I'll bring him in, and we'll begin, and finding out more about Oumuamua. Here we go. We are here at this time, and we bid you greetings, and thank you very much for the opportunity of this interaction today. I am Adronis of Sirius, sending love, appreciation, and gratitude to all who are tuning in to this broadcast through your internet collective consciousness. We have been asked to share insight as it relates to the phenomena that you would term as Oumuamua. In its ancient term to that of Oumuamua, it is referred to as a scout or messenger of your ancient past. The celestial object that you term as Oumuamua is indeed that. You would understand that the Oumuamua phenomenon would be that of several hundred millions of years old, in your terms of counting, approximately. It originated within the rough trajectory in the area that you would know as Lyra. It is indeed a monument of your ancient past. The object itself has been created through what you would know as specific material manipulation relating to asteroids, or again, other particular forms of celestial bodies that are of a dead form. These asteroids are basically carved. They are materialized and carved into a particular cylindrical-like structure, appropriate for the apparatus representing internal technology that is contained within the asteroid form once the interior of the asteroid body in question has been hollowed out. Now, when it is hollowed out, it does not come from either end, but it is actually coming from the center. The center, therefore, again, can be matter manipulated in that form of carving to completely dematerialize the material within the asteroid, and thus there are precious resources within the asteroid, such as minerals of copper, gold, nickel, silver, iron, etc., they are therefore extracted and again can be placed in appropriate use to building the interior of this transport device. But the interior is hollowed out. We would estimate that approximately 75 to 80 percent of the interior of the asteroid form is hollowed out. And again, it contains a somewhat internal measurement area that is still having a thick outer husk 
relating to that of the asteroid form in question. As it is therefore hollowed out, there will be specific supplies, or again, what you would term as resources, such as metals, precious ores, etc., that are therefore imbued within the asteroid. It is not done through what you would term as your own forms of understanding construction technology. It is holographically overlaid. Basically, you would understand a four-dimensional map. And this four-dimensional map looks into the idea of overlaying holographically through space and through time the idea of, shall we say, particular dwellings that would exist within the asteroid based upon its purpose. So it therefore overlays, it maps out the geometry of the asteroid form that is now hollowed out, and it also works together, together in a state of time. And what this means is that, as many of you are aware, or maybe not aware, that when you go into an extraterrestrial spacecraft, you may notice that the interior of the spacecraft is actually larger when you step inside than what the outside appears to be. This is the idea of the 4D holographic mapping. It actually creates its own dimension within itself. So if you were basically to look at a one mile long celestial object, and by using the 4D holographic overlaying map, you can actually step inside and it can be several miles long instead of just the single mile as it appears on the outside. Well, this again is part of the 4D holographic mapping. It has its own continuum, we will say, its own dimensional overlay in that way. So this is quite common. Now, it's not to say that this particular asteroid may have that technology, but this is actually quite common for many other forms of spacecraft that were hollowed out. Now, with Oumuamua, as it becomes constructed, it is basically a very long cylindrical shaft pertaining to technological aspects. So you will discover that there are bays, that there are corridors, and that there are pods in that particular way. And that the crew, dependent upon the number, will incubate themselves into these pods as a means, as a type of stasis, to basically perform celestial travel. Now, as we have stated, Oumuamua has been several hundreds of millions of years old. You cannot really determine the age by, again, attempting to, shall we say, measure the time constraint pertaining to the asteroid itself. You would need to go inside. You would need to look at the technology in that way. You could look at the idea of carbon dating because many of the life forms within Oumuamua have carbon. And these particular life forms consist of six main types of being. First, being human, but human of a different design, somewhat larger than yourselves. The aspect of the facial features of the human being themselves may differ from your own understanding of your human design. Second, representing that of reptilian. Third, representing that of avian. Fourth, representing that of aquatic. Fifth, representing that of mammalian. Six, representing that as insectoid. Human, reptilian, avian, aquatic, mammalian, insectoid. These would be the six archetypes. Therefore, humanity being the sixth root race. So when you look within this spacecraft and you discover within the pods these particular life forms, many of them are not alive. This particular ship basically had a set trajectory, but encountered a great deal of difficulty along the way. The crew are not alive. They are contained in stasis pods, but they are completely preserved, similar to what you would understand as a vacuum. 
Now again, looking into the ancient reptilian, the ancient avian, the ancient mammalian, the ancient insectoid, the ancient aquatic, they all have different functions as it pertains to, shall we say, their own form of ecosystem that was appropriate. Some required certain degrees of apparatus because they were not all compatible with the same atmosphere. So some would use certain forms of apparatuses to therefore mimic their own appropriate ecosystems. But this was in that sense an intention for a joint venture. And this joint venture in that sense involved these ancient descendants of Lyra to eventually make a contact with the human race. However, as we stated that there were encounters of difficulty, basically from what you would know as quantum wave or gravitational wave phenomena, pockets of space in that sense that may have been unstable, that may have actually affected the ecosystem internally within the vessel. So you could say that there were certain forms of quote unquote system errors, system malfunctions, and therefore the craft itself has been piloting itself. The craft itself would be alive, you would say. You could liken it to the idea of an artificial intelligence, but we would state it as much more of a crystalline intelligence relating to Oumuamua. So therefore, with the six races that were contained within Oumuamua, none of them have survived. It is for you to know that your governments have already been docked upon Oumuamua, what you would term as your space programs, have already visited this craft and are profoundly excited by what has been revealed within it. Because many of the corpses, we will say, have been apprehended, and taken off the vessel for further study and scrutiny. This in indeed is the ancients of your past, to which many of you are derived from, and that Oumuamua's original intention was to come into the Sol system, and it was the hope that humanity would evolve to the degree by the time it got here, so that all of humanity would be able to visit Oumuamua because there are trinkets on board Oumuamua specifically for you. This also relates to the idea of genetics, that you can actually observe the genetics of the beings that were placed within stasis. Originally, they were going to volunteer and therefore share their genetic information to prove to you their ancient inheritance to all of you. These six root races within Lyra still exist to this very day. This again was all part of a unification, a shared venture between the six root races to therefore come upon the star system of Earth and therefore interact with their family. Unfortunately, there were complications upon the journey and the crew did not survive. Yet their bodies are completely preserved and they realize that this may have been a risk. And this is again why they utilize the idea of pods within Oumuamua to preserve their bodies should there be a problem. However, it is important for you to know that the crystalline interface intelligence is capable of communicating with humanity. And that again, it does require a particular form of telepathic link. But there were indeed instructions that would actually work together with all of your earth languages that would allow Oumuamua to be in that sense, this relic to be cherished by humanity. However, your governments have other ideas. And so they have not interrupted the course of Oumuamua. They have basically taken everything that they feel is of important value from Oumuamua and are now upon other forms of installations 
observing and analyzing the data, as well as the biological data representing that of the deceased bodies that are again, perfectly preserved. This again was the nature of Oumuamua, was to again function as a messenger, an ancient messenger from Lyra to come adrift for many, many millions of years because again of the errors, of the difficulties, of the turbulences that took place during their transit. Now again, Oumuamua did have certain forms of Again, course corrections. But again, there were still different forms of, shall we say, complications along the way. It was not in the idea of feeling that any other particular form of celestial visitor boarded Oumuamua. They wouldn't. In that likelihood, it is the idea that Oumuamua is indeed a relic. It's a primitive spacecraft. Many other civilizations really aren't interested in it. They look at it and they say, well, it's just a asteroid, internal spacecraft, an arc. Let it be. And many allowed the trajectory of Oumuamua to come together. As we stated, none of the biological passengers, as it were, piloted Oumuamua. They were kept in stasis. And so as they were kept in stasis, it was their hope that humanity would be able to wake them up. As we've stated, none of them survived. They were contained in stasis pods, perfectly preserved. Well, Adronis, what would many of them look like? As we stated, for the human, somewhat taller, between what you would know as your seven to seven and a half, perhaps even eight feet in height. Again, similar facial features to you. Some would be in that sense, to what you would term as being somewhat pale white or pale light blue in appearance. The idea of the reptilians would be more so in the idea of what you would know as your common lizards. You know, it was not Draco, but it was in that sense an indigenous reptilian from Lyra, very similar to your newts, your gecko lizards in that particular way. The third being that of an aquatic representing that of what you would term as somewhat fish-like. Basically, in that sense, having a head similar to a particular type of fish, having gills in that particular way, but again, wearing apparatus to support the idea of the breathability of atmosphere that would again encompass the appropriateness of breathability within the body of the being itself. But again, very much looking like a fish-like head or again, somewhat, in some particular degree, amphibious to a degree as well. What you would know as webbed hands, webbed feet. Somewhat appearing silverish to blue in appearance. The idea of the avian. Avian, in that sense, would appear, shall we say, more so. We are attempting to get a good example. A very long beak somewhat of a long neck, hands, appendages, feathers, but not quite capable of flight, as you would term. Although looking into the idea of their upright bipedal posture, they would be able to have, in that sense, great amounts of agility, and basically, in that sense, large looping, leaping ranges, in that sense. Very similar to what you would term as your ostrich. But again, not so much in the idea of its appearance. Appearance, again, very, very similar to what you would term like a sparrow or a robin in that way, with a long beak. And again, black eyes like an avian bird. No, not the blue avians. But again, somewhat bird-like in that particular way. Relating to a cross between humanoid and avian. If we were to look at your next aspect pertaining to that of insectoid, the insectoid would appear much more like a locust in that particular way. A locust or cricket in that particular way pertaining to its own facial features. One of many different forms of insectoids that exist within Lyra. So these again give you some particular imprint 
as it relates to the six races. So human, reptilian, avian, mammalian, which we'll also get to in a moment, insectoid, and aquatic. The mammalian would actually look very, very similar to your Sasquatch. Almost identical, we would say. Similar in appearance, again, approximately seven to seven and a half feet in height. We could say that much of the tallest being that would be of the bunch would actually be the reptilian, close to eight feet in height. So the mammalian being would have more of what you would know as a sandy brown fur. Hair in that particular way, completely covered, but again, looking very much like what you understand your Sasquatch to appear as. So again, these represent the six occupants altogether pertaining to Oumuamua. Were there multitudes of these different occupants? No. Six passengers. So Oumuamua, again, will continue its own particular trajectory. It will slingshot itself around the sun's gravity and again continue off course back into the exiting of your star system. It is uncertain of its continual trajectory at this particular time, but it will, in that sense, pass through your neighborhood core system areas. So again, there has been data obtained throughout Oumuamua's internal, shall we say, dwellings. Again, the idea of Oumuamua is that it was indeed propelled similarly to what you would know as a quantum field or a zero-point energy system. And again, much in regards to its acceleration came through the idea of harnessing gravitational fronts throughout different stars and being able to propel it. But again, this was all part of the journey of the six volunteers that existed upon Oumuamua to eventually greet you in person, to speak with many of you, and to share much in your stories relating to how all of you originated from Lyra and how their ancient DNA is part of your DNA as well too. That is what Oumuamua came here to do. But we will say that in the times ahead, the idea of Oumuamua will continue to be scrutinized. It will be challenging to state that if the corpses in that sense will actually be revealed to the public. We do not see that happening anytime soon. But there could be, again, more information in your greater times ahead relating to Oumuamua. So we may elaborate on this a little bit more down the road, should any of you have further curiosity pertaining to Oumuamua. But indeed, an ancient messenger, an ancient scout from your past. I am Adronos of Sirius. We thank you very much, and we will now conclude this interaction, and we will speak to you again, as now is forever, all is one, and love is essence. Goodbye for now. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in to uh, this video with Adronos. And again, we may have some more follow-up information that Adronos can give pertaining to Oumuamua. It, of course, is a very fascinating topic. Uh, it was in the book, and I really wanted to share that. Uh, Jonas talked a lot more about it <laughs> than what is just in the book. So again, it'll be very, very exciting to, to hear a lot more about Oumuamua in the times ahead. All right. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll speak to you again in another perspective of the now. Take care.